Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim McKee. I'm the site manager here at uh, Brunswick Town Fort Anderson State Historic Site. And I want to talk to you all a little bit about the golden age of piracy. Now, when we talk about pirates, you know, usually two names come to mind, Blackbeard and Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow didn't exist. Um, and, and Jack Sparrow is, is, yeah, he's made up. And, and that's the problem, the big problem with pirates is this, what I call factual fictions and fictional facts. A lot of what we know about piracy is based on popular literature, Treasure Island, um, Disney, movies, TV shows. It's all popular culture. But it is, some of that is based on fact. Um, for example, the way pirates dress. The majority of the time, if you saw a pirate, you wouldn't be able to distinguish a pirate from, if, especially on sea, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that pirate from a pirate or a regular honest sailor. They all look and dress basically the same. It's when they get on land that they start looking a little flamboyant and you can see from this um screen right here sam bellamy and and john king and with some of uh sam bellamy's crew they all dress pretty much like common sailors like i said it's when they get onto land that they start dressing a little bit more flamboyant that's because well most of them were men most of them try to attract the ladies um, and to make themselves look a little higher society. Now, golden age of piracy is going to um, develop at the end of Queen Anne's War or the War of Spanish Secession around 17, 1713. And essentially what happens is during Queen Anne's War, you've got what's going on in the Caribbean. You've got a lot of the different uh, empires that are jockeying for position and jockeying for um, islands out in the Caribbean so they can, they can open markets, they can make more money, claim more land. And so what's going on in the Caribbean during Queen Anne's War or the War of Spanish Secession is a lot of privateering. Now, what is a privateer? Privateer is nothing more than a legal pirate. And this legal pirate is basically they're, they're sailors who have what's called a letter of mark or permission from a king to prey on enemy shipping, enemy um, colonies, whatever. And in their minds, they're perfectly within the law. Now, to the people that they're attacking, they're nothing more than common pirates. So, when the War of Spanish Secession ends, you've got thousands of out-of-work privateers because it just ends abruptly. And so, what are these people going to do? Well, some of them do go back to their home countries, um, go back to being common sailors, but a lot of them, a lot of them were disenfranchised with the conditions that they had to live under as sailors. Sailors were, sailors had a very, very hard life. Food was terrible. Uh, conditions were even worse. There, a lot of times the, the treatment by their captains or the companies they're working for was horrible. Even in the navies, there was there was hardships there was severe punishments so a lot of these quote unquote privateers well they just stayed in the caribbean and went on what they called went on the account or took up piracy now the two main pirates at this time in 1713 are going to be benjamin hornigold and henry jennings and they're basically these pirates need to find a haven 
and they they find this kind of defunct outpost in the Caribbean, just happens to be called Nassau in the Bahamas, and they basically take it over. And within no time, there's thousands of pirates. And so it's almost like a republic of pirates. And these pirates are, you could almost say, they're the first Democrat, Democrats in, or the democratic society in the new world. Um, they, they have no loyalty to any crown, any flag. They're loyal to themselves. They vote on just about everything. So they, they have their own society, their own way of governing. And essentially they take over the Caribbean. I mean, it's in no time, they are the leaders. They are the owners of the Caribbean. Now, the pirate factions basically get divided up into two groups. You've got the flying gang under Benjamin Hornigold, and you've got the, um, the privateers under Henry Jennings. And they don't like each other. They do not like each other. And so even though they cohabitate at Nassau, they really don't have a lot. The two factions, especially the leadership in the two factions, really don't have a lot to do with each other. But some of the things that they're going to do is going to just really dictate how the uh, future is going to look for pirates and how the histories are going to be written. For example, um, in, let's see, 1715. Yeah, 1715, two years in, almost two years in, off Bahia Honda. And Bahia Honda is, a, is an area around in Cuba. There was a French warship in the harbor at Bahia Honda. Offshore was Henry Jennings in his ship. And they were flying false colors, so they weren't raising any alarm or anything, but they were, they were kind of scouting the situation, trying to get a look at this, um, this French ship that's in there and figure out what they're going to do. At the same time, there's two pirates, uh, Sam Bellamy and Paulsgrave Williams, that are doing the same thing. The only difference is Bellamy and Williams aren't these well-to-do pirates, so they don't actually have a ship. They've got two periaguas, which are basically ocean-going canoes, hold about 40, 45 men each, and they can be rigged with a sail. And they're doing the same thing. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, they end up, Bellamy, Williams, and Jennings end up noticing each other and they start talking and realize they're after the same thing. So they come up with a plan to attack this French ship. They, they send a boat into the harbor and strike up relations with the French. The French captain invites these quote unquote sailors on board their ship that evening for, to dine and they go back and they start making preparations. Now, what they're gonna do is, Jennings is gonna get his ship rigged for battle. Paulsgrave Williams and Sam Bellamy are gonna actually make the attack. And while they're occupying the French warship, that's when Jennings will come in and make the attack. Now, offshore, just happens to be sailing by, is Benjamin Hornigold. And so he stops well offshore to observe what's going on. So at the allotted time, Bellamy and Williams and their pirates start rowing into the harbor as hard as they can. They're brandishing every type of weapon you can imagine. They're screaming at the top of their lungs and they're all naked. 
naked as the day they were born. The French on board the warship, it startles them. They have no idea what's going on. They think they're being attacked by cannibals or whatever. And before they know what's happened, they've been taken. In the meantime, Jennings is just getting his ship underway. He's just getting a ship into the harbor. So by the time he gets in there, it's all over. And offshore is Benjamin Hornigold. Well, Benjamin Hornigold's first mate is a man by the name of Edward Teach or Edward Thatch, whichever name you want to go by. And he will eventually change his name to a more famous moniker of Blackbeard. But Teach sees what's going on. He realizes, my God, they've just taken a French warship without firing a shot. It's brilliant. And after it's all done, they sail away. Well, what's going to end up happening in the long run is Bellamy and Williams are going to double cross Jennings and essentially take everything of value and then disappear. Well, Bellamy will end up, Bellamy and Williams will end up upgrading their little fleet from canoes to sloops. And they will end up operating a lot around Barbados, which is going to influence another pirate or future pirate by the name of Steed Bonnet. Now, in the meantime, Benjamin Hornigold finds out that Bellamy has black as double crossed Jennings. So automatically they become first allies. And Teach starts really looking up to Bellamy. And Bellamy and, and Williams really they they do a lot and they capture a lot of vessels and commit some atrocities, but they end up capturing a, a slave ship, which they'll rename the Witta. And they, um, they end up amassing a huge fortune. Now, Bellamy and Williams are from Massachusetts. So in um, um, April of 1717, they decide that they've amassed enough fortune and it's time to settle the accounts. It's time to, to pull in somewhere and start dividing the treasure. And it just so happens that they're up in the North Atlantic. So they decide they're going to visit their homes before they... Um, you know, divide everything up. And, but anyway, a storm hits and they get separated. Williams and his ship are further offshore. Bellamy and in, in, in the Widow ends up being much closer to shore and actually gets driven ashore on the rocks in this major storm. And they get dashed against the rocks. And I mean, a lot of these sailors die or drown within sight of their homes. But the widow has just an amazing cargo. Just It was just loaded down. And so over the course of the next couple of days, you've got this wrecked ship that's, you know, aground. You've got cargo all over the decks. I mean, all over the beaches. You've got bodies all over the beaches. Only four pirates on board the Widow survived. They were, ca they were captured, taken to Boston, tried, and then hanged. Now, that's going to have a big influence on Blackbeard. That's going to influence what he's going to be doing. Now, with the death of Sam Bellamy, um, Paul Graves, Paul's Grave Williams, he continues being a pirate and he will um, end up joining together with other pirate captains. He never really becomes an arch pirate, but 
he's smart enough that he is going to be a rare pirate. You know why he's rare? He ends up being old. He will retire in 1723 at the age of 45. So, yeah, he has a, he has a good he has a good life, um, tough life, but a good one. Now, if you look on the screen here, the Bermuda Sloop. This is prime. This is the primary vessel that the pirates are using. The Bermuda Sloops, they are they're 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 decent size. I mean, you're talking anywhere from 10 to 45 tons. So they come in various sizes, but they're fast and they're shallow. And in the, in the Caribbean, that's, that's huge because the, um, yeah. And, and Sam Bellamy was one of the, of course, one of the pirates that, that drowned on board the, the Witta. But there was, and there was nothing they could have done, nothing at all. Now, going back to the Bermuda Sloop, the Bermuda Sloop, like I said, was, was shallow draft, fast, and very maneuverable, which was key in the Caribbean because the waters there, you know, the islands are usually surrounded by coral reefs. You got a lot of shallows, you got a lot of shallow bays. So, Pirates could get into places that warships could not. By 1717, by the time Sam Bellamy is dead, the numbers of pirates have grown. So you're looking at anywhere from 2,000 to 2,500 pirates. There are not enough warships in the European powers to protect all the assets in the Caribbean from the pirates, especially those with these Bermuda sloops. Cause you get a warship coming in. All the pirates have to do is cut across shoals, cut across a reef, get into a shallow Harbor and they can't be touched and they just disappear. So these Bermuda sloops were vital. You get these rare pirates like Sam Bellamy and eventually Blackbeard and a couple others that actually get bigger ships, these slave ships, they're not looking. And when, when they do that, they're going to have a fleet with them. And when I say a fleet, they may have three to seven ships, depending on how many crew and, and how much they want to do. And so you're, you'll, you'll have a mother ship, which would be in the case of, of Bellamy, the widow. And then when they get ready to, you know, call it a call it a, a voyage or call it a cruise, then they may start getting rid of some of those vessels and consolidating. But the Bermuda sloop is going to be the primary vessel that the that the pirates are going to use. And they'll hold anywhere from six to twelve guns. And all the guns are going to be located on the deck and it'll be a mixed variety of six pounders four pound four pounders six pounders you might have one or two nine pounders um, and a lot of swivel guns now when i talk about pounders i'm talking about the weight of the solid shot that the that the cannon will fire so last moments of the widow and it, like I said, it is a massive treasure. Now the Widow is going to be the first pirate ship found. Um, she'll be found, I want to say 1980, somewhere around there, she was found. And the treasure that came off her was just phenomenal. I mean, it was obvious that Bellamy had, Bellamy and Williams had struck it rich. A lot of silver coins and, just all grades of, of booty, as you might want to say. But one of the more interesting things they found was a leg. And you can see the leg, you can see the leg bone, and you can see it's still inside a silk stocking, and you can see the, the, the shoe. And it was because of finding this, 
that for many years, um, historians thought pirates were fairly short. They were shorter. And it was a proven fact that a lot of times sailors could be shorter than landsmen. I mean, it was proven that the American colonists in many ways were, could be an inch to two inches taller than their English counterparts. And it was all based on diet. But with this one, they thought, my God, pirates were small. Well, they did research years later and found out that there was a crewman quote unquote crewman on board named Jack King or John King. Um, John King or Jack King was only 12 years old. And they figured this out and they figured out this was his leg. They found it crushed underneath a, a cannon that they recovered. Um, there was an article, they, they captured a ship, Bellamy captured a ship off Barbados and one of the things that pirates would do when they captured ships is they would segregate the crew from the officers. So the, the crew might go to one section of the ship. The officers would be put on another section of the ship and they would ask the crew, the pirates would ask the crew certain questions. How are you treated? How are your officers? Da, da, da. Yeah, that sort of thing. And they're going to ask who wants to join. And so anyone who wants to join, they'll say, all right, head over to the ship. After you tell us where everything is on this ship, um, head over to the ship and you're part of the crew. Well, apparently there was this 12 year old boy on board that wanted to join the pirates and his mother had a conniption. Go figure. His mother had a conniption. No, 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 you're not going to join. Well, Bellamy, said if he wants to join he's old enough to join and so they took him willingly he he went with them willingly and later on historians found an uh, uh, an advertisement in a barbadian newspaper from the mother to have mariners look out for her son described what he was wearing the silk stocking, the patent leather shoe, and last seen with Black Sand Bellamy. So they were pretty sure this, not, it, it, yeah, the boy was well to do. And so they're pretty sure this, this leg bone belonged to Jack King. And let's see, we'll go back. There he is. There's little Jack. Right beside Sam Bellamy. Fanciful, of course. And if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see their impression that they think that's Jack King moments before he dies. Now, with the death of, of Sam Bellamy, that's going to somewhat leave a gap. But by the time this, his death occurs, he's influenced several more pirates. None more famous than Edward Teach or Blackbeard. Now, based on what Blackbeard sees at Bahia Honda, at this point, Edward Teach, who's still going by the name Edward Teach and is, and is you know, Hornigold's first mate, he starts letting his beard grow out. Now, did he already have a beard? We don't know. Either way, he lets it grow out. And eventually, Hornigold has, has told him he's going he's gonna to have his own ship one day. And sure enough, he's going to get his ship. And he is in 17, in the, in the summer of 1716, after they come back from a, from a cruise, that's when, well, 1717, that's when uh, they get into Nassau and 
that's when Hornigold says, yeah, you're, you're up for your own command. I need you for one more cruise and then I'm going to let you have your own. All right. In the meantime, in Bermuda or excuse me, Barbados, a kind of bored, rich, former militia, British militia officer by the name of Steve Bonnet um, is having a, 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 I'd say a midlife crisis. He's married. He owns a sugar plantation. He's his, his son and heir has just died. He's already, he's got two other children, but, his son that he's named after himself has just died. So he's, he's fighting boredom. He's fighting depression. Some say his wife was driving him crazy. Either way, either, however you want to put it, this guy kind of gets a screw loose and he's listening to all these stories of Sam Bellamy, the pirate. And he's like, he's got to be thinking, Oh man, this is, this is going to be an adventure. Let's see what we can do. Well, one day a ship sails into the har one of the harbors at Barbados with another ship in consort. And the captain of the ship says he just found that ship and brought it into port. Now the law, the Admiralty law stated back then that if you find a ship and there's no one on board, well, you got to bring it into the nearest port where it will sit for a year until the rightful owner can come and claim it. If after a year, the rightful owner doesn't claim it, then it goes up for auction. Now there's debate as to what Steve Bonnet did. Um, you, know, you think about it. How do, uh, how do pirates get their vessels? Well, of course they do it the old fashioned way. They steal them. Well, Bonnet didn't do that. Um, Many people believe he won. He, he bought that ship at auction. Others say he had a ship built purpose built just for, for piracy. I tend to lean towards it was the, um, the former he bought it at auction. Either way, if there was anybody who should not have been a pirate, it was probably Steve Bonnet. Um, Bonnet, the only thing he really knew about the water or the ocean was you got wet if you fell in and you could get fish out of it and you could sail on it. But as far as a ship goes, he didn't know fore from aft, port from starboard, jib sail, anything. He didn't know any of that, but he was smart enough and rich enough to hire a crew, a competent crew which is what he did. He went out and, and bought himself a crew. Now <clears throat> where Bonnet is also different is the fact that he did buy his crew. So he also bought their loyalty for the most part. But anyway, so Bonnet gets his ship and they go, they outfit it. They go, um, um, they go out on the account and somewhere in, in 17, late 17s, let's see, this is going to be early, early 1718. They're at the Gulf of Honduras and they come across, excuse me. No, this is later in 1717. They're in the Gulf of Honduras and they come across a vessel and bonnet decides he wants to attack it well there's a hitch that vessel just happened to be the costa garda which is the spanish coast guard it's a coast guard vessel it's a warship rule number one when you're a pirate do not attack a warship unless you heavily 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 have the advantage do not attack rule number two when in doubt, refer to rule number one. Bonnet attacked and they got waxed. So bad, Bonnet was severely wounded. They were able to extricate himself from that situation 
and limped away and made their way to Nassau. And so they start going into Nassau. Here's this unknown vessel. And of course, all the, you know, everyone there questions what's going on, who they are and everything. And they tell them who they are and ask for, um, sanctuary. Yeah. You know, and they say, you can stay here. You know, once they find, once the pirates find out what they did, they said, yeah, you can stay here until you're healed and repairs are effected. So a few, several weeks go by and Bond is still recovering. They've got the ship fixed. Benjamin Hornigold and Edward Teach are about to go out on a cruise and they need one more vessel. So they asked Bonnet if they can borrow his vessel. He can stay on board, but they want to borrow their vessel. And then when he's healed up and they've got another vessel captured, they'll set him free, you know, set him loose. And he, he agrees. What else is he going to do? So, you know, a month or so goes by there. They, they, they make a few captures and Hornigold decides at that point, the now named Blackbeard, remember him, is ready for his own command. So Hornigold gives Blackbeard a couple of ships plus Bonnet's ship and says, you're now an arch pirate. Have at. And so they, they split, they separate. And Bonnet, uh, Blackbeard and Bonnet go their own way. Um, and things aren't, you know, they're not doing very well. But Bonnet has healed up enough and Blackbeard's tired of having him tow along. So they cut Bonnet loose. So Bonnet and his ship go off in a different direction and Blackbeard and his ship go off in a different direction. Bon, uh, Blackbeard goes up towards Cuba. Guess where Bonnet goes? He goes back to the Gulf of Honduras. And guess what he does? He gets wrapped up with another Spanish Coast Guard vessel and gets waxed again. Doesn't get wounded, but gets, they, they get chewed up pretty bad. And so they are able to extricate themselves again and they start sailing out towards Cuba and they're going by a harbor and they see a couple of vessels in there and they think they recognize them. And sure enough, it's Blackbeard. Well, the two pirate crews come together and there's partying and jocularity going on. And at that point, that's when Bonnet's crew approach Blackbeard and say, look, this guy's going to kill us. Will you please take over? And Blackbeard, being Blackbeard, agreed. Should be glad to. But he's got to figure out how to do this tactfully so that he doesn't make a true enemy out of Bonnet. Make it seem like it's, it's, Bonnet's, it's, it's to Bonnet's benefit. You can say a lot of things about Blackbeard. Stupid he was not. He was actually a very intelligent man. Um, so he uh, um, invites Bonnet over to a ship. They dine rum flows, wine flows, everything. And, and when, uh, when Bonnet is fairly well schnockered, that's when Blackbeard makes his move. And he says, look, you're a gentleman. You're very intelligent. You don't need the hardships of being the captain of a ship. You need light duty. You need to just sit back in your cabin and do the books, take care of accounts, and just reap the benefits without any fuss or muss or any exertion whatsoever. And in his drunken stupor, Bonnet agreed. So just like that, Bonnet becomes, quote unquote, a prisoner. He's not but he's almost, he loses command of his ship. His crew's happy. He's happily or blissfully drunk. Blackbeard's happy. Everybody's happy. 
And about a week later, after Bonnet has thoroughly sobered up and realizes what's happened, that he's been duped, he's not real pleased. But there's nothing he can do about it. Um, months pass, and in uh, in the summer of 1718, they have not made too many captures. And so there's the uh, there's lack of food, lack of fresh water, disease is running rampant on all the vessels. And so they're, they're in the mid Atlantic. They're actually all, yeah, around South Carolina and they approach Charleston or Charlestown. And it's at that point that they make the decision to blockade Charleston Harbor. They capture a couple of the of the city aldermen and a few other wealthy members of the of the city and hold them ransom now they're pirates what are they after gold treasure jewels all that no 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 they ransomed them for medicine for one box of medicine that's all that's what they're after. Um, after a few days, Charleston does relent and send them a box of medicine. As soon as they get their medicine, they release their prisoners. Off they go. Now, this leads me to what are, we'll take a quick break, what are the pirates after? When they, when they capture a ship, all right, first thing they're going to do is try to scare the ship into surrendering without without a fight you know if you if you if you have to fight another ship sure you might get some of your people wounded or even killed but more importantly you might damage some of the cargo on that other ship or flat out destroy it which you don't want to do <clears throat> so they want to scare these vessels into surrendering if they do have to fight then they're going to stand off and fire um grape and canister and grape and canister actually ugh, i just happened to have a canister shot or a grape shot right here these are small cannonballs um, you can fire, um, you can load your, your cannon with those small shot. You can fire, you can load them with, um, musket balls, but you're going to shoot those. You can also, I have one of these too. You can also fire. Bar shot. Now, bar shot, you're going to fire at the at the mass in the rigging, and this is going to tear the mass in the rigging apart. Once you disable the ship and the ship can't move, it's got to surrender. Then, with the grape and the canister, you can also do the same thing: shoot at the sails and hold the sails so it slows the ship down, or you can shoot that at the decks and kill the the crew. So. That's what the pirates do. But then once they get on board, like I said, they're going to divide the crew and the officers. They're going to ask who wants to join. If anyone wants to join, they'll find out what's going on or where everything is, what's on board the ship. Let them be crewmen. If they don't want to join, yet they find out that somebody has a special skill that they need, say a navigator, a doctor, especially a doctor. Um, Carpenters, uh, sailing, uh, they can, seamstresses, whatever. Any anybody who's got a good trade, whether they want to join or not, sorry, you're coming with us. Um, and then they'll ask what the office, how the officers were treating them. If the office, if the captain's a tyrant, oh, they're going to have fun. They might even hang the the captain. At the very least. 
They're going to make him run the gauntlet. They may beat him. They may whip him. Do anything, depending on how bad that man is to the crew. Because to the pirates, it's all about how the, how the crew's treated. If the crew says, Captain is great. He he's, gives us our rum ration. He's, he doesn't beat us. He's not a tyrant. Then all is good. If any of the other officers end up being tyrants, well, then they may get the wrath of the pirates. But then they're going to start going through and divvying, you know, getting what they can. First thing they're going to be going after, fresh water, fresh food and medicine because you got to eat, you got to drink, and it's sometimes safer to just take it off the ships than it is to pull into a harbor, have to go on shore, find fresh water source, barrel it up, bring it, you know, in the time that you're stopped, somebody might find you. So that, they're going after food, water, medicine. Then they're going after tools, any tools they need to repair that make repairs on their ships, keep making ships better, um, navigation equipment and weapons. And then you're going after the jewels and, and the gold and all that good stuff. So there's, there's a hierarchy on what they're going after now. So therefore that's why Blackbeard was going after medicine. They needed it. Okay. After this, Bonnet and Blackbeard head north into North Carolina. Now, in the meantime, you've got in seven in in latter part of 1717, a man came to the Caribbean by the name of Woods Rogers. Actually, let me let me save Woods Rogers till later. But I'll, I'll explain it. But Woods Rogers comes to the to, comes to the Caribbean bearing a pardon from the king. Since there were so many pirates, and since there was no way, no navy at the time, the Royal Navy was not the Royal Navy that we think of it is, as, as it will become later in the in the 18th century. Royal Navy is just getting big, but it's not big enough to combat all these pirates. So instead of trying to combat and, and plus you got France, you got Spain, you got the Netherlands, you got every, all these other empires asking Britain to take care of the pirates. So what King George the first decides to do is, is, is you can't combat them. So what he's going to do is give them a pardon. So any pirate anywhere, all they have to do, is they have one year from the time the proclamation's made, they have one year to go to any British port, stop any British ship, find any British authority, be it a, a naval officer, an army officer, a civilian, anyone, and renounce piracy. Just say, I'm sorry. And guess what? All's forgiven. Clean slate. Well, when that proclamation made it to the made it to Nassau, when Woods Rogers, within a month, a thousand, almost the half the pirates took the oath. So, I mean, in one fell swoop, you cut the numbers. So we're in 1718. It's getting close to the deadline. And Blackbeard decides, all right, let's retire. Let's say the heck with it. So they go into um, Topsail Inlet as they're going, well, into Beaufort Inlet. So going into Beaufort Inlet, uh, Queen Anne Re Revenge, which is Blackbeard's. Do I have that? Nope. I thought I did. I took it out. Anyway, Blackbeard had a, a slave ship that was called the La Concorde, and he renamed it the Queen Anne's Revenge. And it was a rather large ship to hold 40 guns. And I think they only had maybe 20 guns mounted. But um, anyway, when they're coming into Beaufort Inlet, the ship grounds. 
Now, some people say it was an accident. Some people say Blackbeard did it deliberately. Um, I lean towards it was done deliberately, simply because they had a large crew, a uh, large number of pirates, and very, very little treasure to divide. So he grounds the, he deliberately grounds Queen Anne's Revenge. And with the idea that they'll come back, they'll take the king's pardon, then they'll come back when the heat's off and recover the ship, you know, recover the treasure and everything. They'll guard it, recover the treasure, and then do whatever from there. Um, so they go in, uh, they go up, to, uh, Blackbeard and Bonnet uh, take the oath. And within two weeks, roughly, Blackbeard has double crossed Bonnet and taken a hand select number of crew, gone back to the Queen Anne's Revenge and salvaged it, and then gone out on the account. Well, when Bonnet finds out about this, he goes after. And when they get down to Beaufort Inlet to the Queen Anne to the Queen Anne's Revenge, they realize, yep, it's been stripped. And so they head out. Was well, they're passing North Topsail. Yeah, North Topsail. They notice there's a number of men on the beach. They stop, investigate, and find out these are 19 crewmen that Blackbeard has double double crossed and marooned them. And they ask, Do you want to join us? And they're like, Oh yeah. They take them and they go off. They go back pirating. Now, Bonnet, because he's taken the oath has to change his name and he changes it to Captain Thomas because if he's captured or everyone says bonnet, then, you know, whatever he did before with the, with the taking of the oath is revoked. He will be hanged on the spot, no trial, no nothing. So he changes his name to Captain Thomas and changes the name of the ship from revenge to Royal James. And he never does catch up with Bonnet. And by uh, mid to the end of August, the Royal James is in foul shape. It's sailing very sluggishly. It needs some repairs. And we think from their visit to Charleston on their way back when they passed the Cape Fear, they realized this, this would be a good haven. So um, somewhere in mid-August, mid to end of August, they sail into the Cape Fear River and sail up past what is now Southport into a, a creek called Fiddler's Drain, which has now been re since renamed Bonnet's Creek. They, they, they pull into Fiddler's Drain. Excuse me, I need some coffee. And... Um, they start effecting repairs on the ship and they end up staying a little bit too long. And while they're there, reports come in that there's pirates operating in the Cape Fear. And the, 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 the governor of South Carolina thinks it's Blackbeard. So he outfits two ships. He gets Colonel William Rhett, to outfit a couple of ships, uh, the Sea Henry, uh, Sea Henry and the Sea Nymph, and they head up to the Cape Fear to capture what they think is Blackbeard. And when they get up here on September 25th, they find that there is, in fact, pirates in the river. Bonnet notices the ship. He goes down to investigate, and realizes his warships, he's learned his lesson. He goes back up to Fiddler's Drain. They outfit the ship for, for action. And the next day, instead of fighting, they're gonna to try to run their way out of the river. So they, uh, that morning, they start heading down the river. The Henry and the Sea Nymph are in the river and the two ship, Rhett's two ships are able to maneuver Bonnet's 
it, we don't know if they are on the landward side of the river or out towards Battery Island on the opposite side of the channel. But anyway, they get them pinned close to the shore. We, we're leaning towards the mainland side, close to where Southport is. Uh, they get them pinned there and Bonnet's ship runs aground. Well, in the, in the process of maneuvering themselves into, into a killing position, both the Rhett's ships run aground. You see, it's the only naval battle in history that I know of where all the ships run aground. So it's that, therefore, it's called the Battle of the Sandbars. And literally for five or six hours, the three ships are stranded out there in, in the Cape Fear River. And for the most part, they're just shouting threats at each other. Now, uh, bonnets, all the ships heal the same direction. They heal this way. And say the tops of my hands are the decks. Bonnet's ship is healed this way. And the Henry and the Sea Nymph are healed this way. So that the wrecked ship's decks are exposed to Bonnet's fire. So the pirates are actually during this lull, this five, six hour lull, they've got the advantage because they can shoot and fire and hit. Whereas they're firing from behind cover. Well, as luck would have it, when the tide started to rise, mm, Rhett ships got off first. And so they were able to maneuver into positions fore and aft. You've heard the term crossing the T when a ship is able to come across and get in front or behind another ship, they could fire their, all their guns, the length of the ship that's crossing the T. If you cross the I, you've got one and four, you've got one aft. And as they were maneuvering to cross the I, um, Bonnet wanted to fight because he knew if he was captured, he was done for. The crew knew that they might survive a surrender, but they wouldn't survive a fight. They convinced, well, they forced Bonnet to surrender. So they surrendered. They were taken to Charleston and in October, November, November, they had the trials and most of, about half of them were convicted of piracy. A few of them were hanged. Bonnet was able to escape and he was escaped for a few days and they finally captured him over on Sullivan's Island. They imprisoned him in the, in what's now called the exchange building in Charleston. So if you're ever in Charleston, you go to the exchange building, the dungeon down below is where Bonnet was imprisoned and it's still there. Um, and then he would be hanged on December 10th. Whoops. December 10th, the small picture on the left is, is the hanging of Steve Bonnet. Uh, and then his body would be just dropped out into the, uh, into the marsh. In the meantime, Blackbeard is, uh, has re somewhat semi-retired to Bath and, or Ocracoke, that area. And, the governor of Virginia is, I uh, understand that Blackbeard is operating in Ocracoke. So he outfits two ships and sends them down um, to take care of, of, uh, of Blackbeard. And <clears throat> of course we know how that worked out. Uh, Blackbeard would be, um, shot numerous times, stabbed numerous times, but it was actually a fatal blow to his neck by a, a, a Scottish broadsword that, that finally dropped him. Um, so with the death of Blackbeard, and Blackbeard is the arch pirate, of course. He's the most well-known. That it doesn't signal the death or the end of the golden age of piracy, but combined with the death of Blackbeard and so many pirates taking the oath, that's, that's leaning towards the, uh, the end of it. 
mean, everyone thinks it's because he, he captured so many ships. He killed so many people and amassed so much treasure. He did none of those. He captured maybe 30 ships. He didn't really amass a huge treasure. And it's actually never been proven that he actually killed anyone. So what made him so the most, probably the most famous pirate marketing, um, that black beard, he was usually, it is described as being taller than most everybody else. Um, he would put slow match in his beard and his hair and set it on fire. Now, when he, they say it sets on fire, no, slow match smolders. So it's not burning, but you could have his head surround, you know, just wreathed in smoke. So it's marketing. That's what made him so good. He marketed himself. Um, but you had others. You had Anne Bonnie, Mary Reed, Jack Rackham. If you look at the, the flag on the upper left, people are like, well, that's Jack Sparrow's flag. No, Jack Sparrow's flag is Jack Rackham's flag. Um, but Jack Rackham had two women pirates. You don't hear much about women pirates because women were considered bad luck on board a ship. And for some odd reason, they're a distraction. Go figure. Um, but Mary Reed and Anne Bonnie were actually two of the more well-known pirates. Anne Bonnie was actually married to a South Carolina planner. And when she was in the, when they were in the Caribbean, she came across Jack Rackham and love at first sight, all that. And so she told her husband, bye and join Jack Rackham's crew, much to the dismay of, of, of much of the crew. Well, they capture a ship and on board is a young sailor named Mark Reed. And it's actually Mary Reed, but she's dressed as a man. And most of Mary's life, she related herself to a male. Um, her mother wanted a son. And when Mary was old enough, she put her in the British army and she ended up fighting in Normandy in, in France where she fell in love with a soldier in her regiment. They got married, uh, retired. She retired from the army. So she, once, once she retired from the army, she exposed herself as a, as a woman, which most of the people in the company at least knew. And the regiment bought her, well, the company ended up buying them a tavern in France. Her husband's going to die. She loses the tavern. She dresses up as a man again, rejoins the army, deserts, goes on board a, a merchant vessel as a sailor, and is captured by Jack Rackham. And Anne Bonnie starts spending a lot of time with Mary, who... Jack doesn't know, but eventually it finds out that, that it's Mary Reed. They are tough customers. They're not to be, they were not to be trifled with. Well, as, as it would be, Rackham and his crew made a nice capture and they were uh, captured at, um, near, um, um, Negro Bay and basically what happened was they got drunk were totally incapacitated British ship sails into the harbor sees them the only two sober pirates are Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed everyone else is drop dead drunk taken without a without a, a fight they're put on trial found guilty Mary and Anne, during the trial, plead their, quote unquote, plead their bellies. They say they're pregnant. Mary was pregnant. Anne is debatable. And, but Jack Rackham was condemned to be hanged. And on the night before, or the, the, the day, the morning of his hanging, they allowed Anne Bonnie to visit Jack. And it's reported her only words to him were, if you had fought like a man, you wouldn't be hanged like a dog and turn around and walked off. 
um, Mary would die of fever. Um, sometime in late 1720, early 1721, she would die of fever in prison. Um, and disappeared. Um, it's rumored that her father, who was a very wealthy planter, found out and paid off to have her released. And it's also believed that she um, remar she mar remarried a wealthy planter and were sent to Virginia. But those were, you had, you had those two. Now, probably the last one, probably the most um, successful pirate is going to be Bartholomew Roberts or Bloody Black Bart. This man was an absolute teetotaler. He didn't cuss. He didn't gamble. He didn't drink. He wore fine clothes. He, um, um, he had Sunday services. He observed the Sabbath. I mean, this guy is the exact opposite of our image and our impressions of pirates, but he was also the most successful. He captured nearly 400 ships in three years. Yes. He was captured by Howell Davis um, in November of 1719. And he was, an, he was a, a, a navigator. He did not want to join the pirates. And they said, sorry, you're with us. And so he was forced, he was impressed uh, to, to, and forced to join the, the pirates. Well, Davis was killed in an ambush at, uh, on the island of, of Principe. He was shot five times and his throat was cut. And so he was dead. And the pirates were able to extract themselves, get back to their ship, and they had to elect a captain. And lo and behold, who did they elect? Bartholomew Roberts who wasn't even part of their crew, but the pirates respected him enough that they wanted him as their captain. So upon his election as, as captain, and when he's asked, what are they going to do? He says, we have a dead captain to avenge. And that's how it all started. He is, if you look at the flag that says that he's standing on two skulls, it says ABH, AMH, that is a Barbadian head and a Martinican head. He single-handedly declared war on Barbados and Martinique. Actually captured the governor and killed the governor of Martinique from his, war, from his ship. Um, and he would end up, Roberts would end up being killed in battle on February 10th, 1722 off the coast of Africa. He, um, they had made a, a somewhat similar to Jack Rackham. They'd made a, a capture and it was a very healthy capture. And he decided to give his crew, you know, allow his crew to blow steam and celebrate. And so they all got drunk. And in the early morning hours, HMS Swallow came by, recognized Roberts's ship. And Roberts is the only one sober. And so the swallow goes by, fires a broadside into the rigging, turns around to come back and give another broadside. And in the meantime, Roberts stands up on top of two cannons, straddles two cannons standing on him, you know, arms out, because there's no way he's going to be captured. And when the British fire their broadside, a uh, ball hits him midsection and cuts him in half. Crew comes up, quickly wraps his body in a sailcloth with some cannonballs, chains it up or ties it up and throws it overboard because his one wish was to not have his body recovered by the Royal Navy.
He did not want to be displayed. So that would be the end of uh, Bartholomew Roberts. And that really does end what would be considered the golden age of piracy. Um, 17, roughly 1724 is going to be the complete end is what I would say. So you're only talking about 11 years, 11 years. Blackbeard's only a pirate for, you know, an arch pirate for about 16 months. Yet all of the stuff we've got. Now, if you want, if people want to read, want, want, a, want a good um, reading on pirates, I would recommend Captain Charles Johnson's A History of the Most Notorious Pirates and Murderers, written in 1724. So it's, it's the, it's the only really is, it's the only firsthand account. Um, and it's readily available and you can, you know, it's been reprinted several times. It's a very thorough book. A lot of, you know, you can't really take it all on fact. You know, you have to, you have to do more research, but consider the history of Captain Johnson's book, Consider that kind of the, the Wikipedia of pirates from a contemporary standpoint. Um, but there are, there, there's a lot of good books out there now. There's also a lot of junk, a lot of, a lot of conjecture, a lot of fantasy. Um, but like I said, piracy, the history of, of piracy is factional fictions and fictional facts. That's the best way to put it. Um, but it is a fascinating period. And unfortunately, um, a lot of what they've done is, you know, glorifying the pirates, sensationalizing them. But the bottom line is pirates of the 18th century just like pirates today, were nothing more than terrorists. I mean, that was, that was, you know, if you think about, if you go back 50 minutes to when I started, um, what did I say? They used terror. They used fear as their primary weapon. That was their chief weapon. And they're terrorists. They are the terrorists of their days. I mean, we think about it now. What we, what, as our society goes through with terrorism around the world, you know, terrorists, terrorists, terrorists. You say, you say the word terrorist. Uh, you say the word ISIS or whatever. And we're, you know, tense. Al-Qaeda, we're tense. Back then, you said pirate. Pirate. And that's all it took. What are the odds that any one of us in America today are going to be attacked or are going to be harmed in a terrorist attack? Slim, very slim. What are the odds that anybody in America was going to be attacked by pirates? Slim, but there's always that chance, especially if you lived on the coast or lived in one of the islands or, or actually had to sail. The odds aren't there, but it was enough to create terrorism. So yes, pirates are nothing more than the terrorists of their day. And they still operate. Let me pull that. This is as of last year, piracy in the world. 162 worldwide attacks, four hijackings, 11 vessels fired on, 17 attempted attacks, 130 boardings. The hot spot, the Gulf of Guinea. So piracy has, is still around. Piracy has always been around. Uh, one of the questions I always get asked is, well, who was the first pirate? Don't know. First pirate was whoever built a boat and someone came along and tried to steal it. That would be your first pirate. It's been around. It's been around forever. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>